What is the process of, of making a documentary? I assume that it starts with financing. How much did this project cost and how did you the, the raise the funds? Yeah, the film cost about $450,000 to complete. Uh, to complete shooting and to get to the first, the, the negative, the, 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 uh, the distribution negative. And it was financed by um, a, a man and his wife, Dan Gifford, and his wife, Amy Summer Gifford. And they financed it privately with their own money. Hmm. Is and that rare? It's very rare. It's very unusual. And they financed it for a number of reasons. They are interested in developing and, and, and expanding their own production company. And this was one of their first productions. And Dan uh, and, and, and Amy also are, were very concerned about some of the uh, issues, the, the justice issues and the, and the um, legal issues that were involved in this story. Yeah. They were interested in that. Yeah. After the money is there, then what happens? Do you then go and compile all your information and find videos and do interviews and all that kind of stuff? How did you get all that? together. Yeah, it was a, it was sort of an ongoing process. Uh, the first, like I said, the first thing we did was we went to Washington D.C. and we thought we would sort of march into Washington and take it by storm, <laughs> and everybody would sort of come over to our hotel and, and we would shoot them, and we'd videotape them, and uh, that didn't happen that way. We found that people, particularly in the FBI and people who worked for the government, didn't want to talk. Didn't want to, to say much. Didn't want to talk to us uh, unless we were with the New York Times. That nobody wanted to appear on camera. In, in terms of, on the government side, and mm -hmm. of course we, we didn't expect that at all, because we, we considered ourselves to be trying to do something that was the right thing. Uh, and the, a lot of the information that came to us came through the attorneys that represented the Branch Davidians in their trial. The infrared and the tapes of the Branch Davidians inside the compound and all of that came to us uh, uh, through their attorneys. So th that was a whole adventure. We went down to Austin and we went through boxes and boxes of, of photos and boxes and boxes of tapes and, and that sort of thing. And, and the, the local CBS station in Waco allowed us to go through their video archives and they had very extensive video archives mm -hmm. and so we got a lot of our footage, uh, video footage from them. And we spent a lot of time on the road. We spent a lot of time on the road trying to... 18 months. Yeah, 18 months. months. Yeah, and, and, well about nine months of that was editing. Mm -hmm. Aside from the satisfaction of the product, was the documentary work the cost of it and you know in in terms of getting it back in the time that it took you to do it in terms of making money is it a money making project at all or definitely well that remains to be seen i mean the money the money side of it it should be a money making pro process mm -hmm. particularly with 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 our uh, the awards that we've won and the recognition that we've gotten mm -hmm. it's a tough road to it's a it's a it's a tough uh, um Process. I think the, the the real money will probably come from the home video sales, yeah. and the international television sales. The BBC is going to air it, and that licensing fee alone will probably cover over half of the budget. Where are documentaries usually usually shown? In small theaters, or does it go straight to television? In this instance, and I think with a lot of documentaries, there are we four wall theaters around the country. We go and rent a theater. Uh, and there are th specialty theaters in many, many cities that specialize in these kinds of, of um, of, uh, what's the word, um, uh, small products, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, non-major products, non-mainstream products. And there's a number of film, a no, number of theaters here in Los Angeles, and there are in many, many cities. And so that was the primary theatrical venue, was, yeah. was in going and four-walling these theaters, renting these theaters. You go into an, ag in a, in agreement with the theater owner, and you split the, the ticket. Do you do any advertising at all, or is that kind of not part of the documentary process? No, advertising is a part of it. Yeah. It's, it's very expensive. So you advertise as, as little as possible and try and get the theaters filled. Mm -hmm. And again, as much um, sort of a critical review as sort of a, a good f form of free advertising, in essence. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you'd like to get into making commercial movies, or is there kind of a, a purity to the tru and truth to a documentary? Well, it's an, it's an interesting question because uh, I, when I was at the uh, Academy Award nominees luncheon and um, I was uh, um, fascinated with the sort of um, good old boy network that exists in the feature film business. And I had worked in feature films when I was mixing sound. And um, everybody sort of knows everybody else in town. And, and here we are, the, the little documentarians were kind of off in the corner, you know, kind of sipping our sodas and talking amongst ourselves, you uh -huh. know. And, and somebody said to me, he said, well, you have to understand that, you know, that a lot of the feature people really, really respect documentarians because you are such consummate filmmakers. We, we really do get to practice the filmmaking craft in such a wonderfully comprehensive manner. We really make the movies. Yeah. Now, they, they may not be big action pieces, but we really get to practice the writing and the directing and the producing and the editing 
you know, a, a, in, in, a, in a very entrepreneurial manner. Mm -hmm. You did all of that for, mm -hmm. the, for that movie. I did. What's the most difficult of the, of the four? I would say the most time consuming and certainly the most um, inga involving was the editing. Yeah. We had over 300 hours of material to work with. And so the, the cataloging of it and the organizing of it and the sort of finding where the, <clears throat> where the thread lay was quite an extensive process. Because in a, in a feature film, you have a script and you have a... You have a, uh, a layout. Uh, yeah, you have a layout. You have a map to follow and it's sort of plug, th plug the scenes in. You shoot the scenes according to the script and you plug them in. And you can play around with some of the timing and, and you can even the juxtaposition of the story elements you know, change what was in the script originally because it may work better a different way. But in a documentary, there really isn't a script. There's a there's a thematic line. There's a there's an overall story. But how you tell it is completely it's, your vision, really. it's totally open ended. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about your earlier years. At 14, you began to form an interest in music mm -hmm. and the music industry. Why was 14 a significant year for you? Or was it? <laughs> well, it was my adolescence first of all, and so it was a, a, that period of time when there were a lot of changes going on. And I have two older brothers, and so I had some role modeling going on because they were four and five years older than I was. And I became in love with music. I love music. And I had never been that involved with music younger than that, and so it sort of became a part of my, a very, very important part of my life. Mm -hmm. And you worked with some major recording artists, Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. um, Joe Cocker, uh, Leo Sayer. You worked with a lot of these people at a, at a young age. Um, how old were you, and what exactly were you? were you doing with these? The prime, the, the prime of my rock and roll career was from about 18 until I was about 24 or 5, mm -hmm. about 25. And how did you break in initially though, before you explain that? Well, I went to a, a, I went to a very w wonderful comprehensive a trade school up in San Francisco called the College for Recording Arts. And they, it was a three year program of sort of advanced vocational training and they covered the technical side of making records as well as the legal and business and um, musical side arranging and it mm -hmm. was very comprehensive in terms of mu the music business in general and so I, I attended the school for three years and I uh, graduated and I had also uh, had tutors that I had hired privately to teach me in some of the special specialty fields and one of my tutors had a friend here in Los Angeles who was managing a studio and so he made a phone call and I came down and got interviewed and got my first job and packed all my stuff up, <laughs> loaded up my car, and drove down here. I was ready to go. Working, yeah. And so what were you doing with, with these different artists at that time period? I was uh, started out as an assistant. Yeah. I was an assistant engineer, which is um, a, a very highly, res I mean, a lot of responsibility and not a, not a lot of glory. I had to make sure that everything was properly organized for a recording session and everything was, all the microphones were set up and all the microphones were properly selected. and that the, the, the man who was engineering or mixing the session had everything that he needed and uh, made sure all the tape logs were correct and all the tapes were properly labeled and you know, made sure that all the little details were, were covered. And I was also in training to, to take the next step, which was to actually make the records. Mm -hmm. and, but how did that, the music industry stuff, lead into documentaries? Or did it well, not really? I, I, my first experience in the film business was in 1978 on a film called The Rose, which starred Bette Midler. And, it was and you, you actually won and an Academy Award for that. That was nominated for Best Sound. For Best Sound. It was nominated for nominated. Best Sound, and I was very involved in the production of the music and the soundtrack in general. I was the associate producer of the, of the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And I was a non-union, this is where we get into the film unions oh, and yeah. all this. I was a non-union sound engineer, and one of the union guys at Fox saw me working one day on the console and sent a complaint into the union. And so the union called up the film's producer, Aaron Russo, by the way, who ended up leading me into the Waco project 15 years later and said you either get this guy off the lot or get him in the union immediately and well I was in the union the next day uh, so I was able to cross over from music into film yeah. through a sort of a happenstance yeah, and it, it seems like it was an important crossover and you've made one of the more wonderful documentaries that I've ever seen right. and we're gonna go out with a clip of that and it looks like we're out of time oh, right. but thank you so much for being with us today and let's just take another look at that thank you insane charismatic cult leader who was hell-bent on bringing about this infernal nightmare in flames and the extermination of the children and the women and the other innocents 
is not an explanation that should be cast aside. Revelation states that Christ has the key of David. And only he can open and none can shut. There's 150 Psalms here. Some people find it amazing that I know every one of them. Vernon Howell thinks he's the Lamb of God, when all he is is a cheap thug who interprets the Bible through the barrel of a gun. Now they're making self-serving statements that ATF opened fire on the compound first. That is an absolute falsehood. There wasn't.